President of the United States of America. Those lucky enough to get the position get government housing, state dinners with the world's most interesting people, and the ability to destroy the modern world in just four minutes. However, like any job, it does have its drawbacks. A president can only serve for two terms, is always under public scrutiny, and perhaps most unusually, the job carries an extraordinarily high mortality rate. Eight of the 45 men who have served have died in office, which means that the US presidency has a mortality rate of 18%, roughly 25 times that of lumberjacks, the second most dangerous occupation in America. So, given those odds, we thought it was only prudent to do a video about what happens if the president is temporarily incapacitated or removed from office, whether through impeachment, resignation, or even death. Luckily for the American government, a succession plan is in place to ensure the legacy of the American presidency is continued, but there are some wacky situations which can cause a constitutional crisis, which we'll explore in this video. If you like explainers like this, which dive into the details and drama of US politics and news, then be sure to subscribe. You can also find us on Twitter and Instagram for even shorter explainers, so you can stay informed while you scroll. We really appreciate your support. First though, let's start off with a situation everyone is probably familiar with. What happens if the president dies via assassination? Four American presidents have been assassinated. Abraham Lincoln in 1865, James Garfield in 1881, William McKinley in 1901, and John F. Kennedy in 1963, all involving firearms. Once the assassination happens, the vice president will be taken to a secure location to take the presidential oath of office and then become the president. In the Kennedy assassination, Kennedy's vice president, Lyndon Johnson, took the oath on Air Force One, the main presidential aircraft. From there, they would hurry their way back to the White House and hold an emergency cabinet meeting, while funeral arrangements are made. Anyway, the same thing happens following the death of the president due to natural causes, impeachment, and resignation. The vice president takes the oath of office and becomes the president. Once the VP takes the role of president, they must then fill the vacancy for vice president. In accordance with the 25th Amendment of the United States Constitution, ratified in 1967, the newly minted president must nominate a vice president who will be confirmed to the position by a majority of both the US House and US Senate. Before the 1967 amendment, if the vice president was forced to take the presidency, they didn't need to find a new VP. Every vice president who assumed office as a result of presidential assassination didn't have a vice president for the remainder of their term. This means that the US House and US Senate have only ever confirmed two new vice presidents, with Richard Nixon appointing Gerald Ford to the vice presidency in 1973, following the resignation of the elected VP on corruption charges, and then again when Gerald Ford nominated Nelson Rockefeller in 1974 after Nixon resigned. Interestingly, this gave the Ford-Rockefeller administration the unique distinction of being the only presidential administration entirely unelected by the people, but rather appointed by Congress. Anyway, enough about death. What happens if the president has to be put under sedation or anesthesia for a medical procedure? Well, they obviously don't have to officially leave office. But under Section 3 of the 25th Amendment, the president in that scenario yields their power to the vice president, who is then the acting president until the actual president has regained consciousness. This has happened four times in American history, mostly for colonoscopies. However, on all four occasions, the acting president did nothing of significance. The last way a vice president might take over from a president is via section 4 of the 25th Amendment, which states that the vice president and a majority of cabinet members can vote to remove the president if they deem him or her to be, quote, unable to discharge the powers and duties of their office. You might have even heard this being discussed last year in regards to Donald Trump and the January 6th event. If the vice president and a majority of the cabinet agree to remove the president, then the vice president becomes acting president. 
The original president could challenge the determination, and the vice president and cabinet majority would then have four days to convince Congress to remove the president by a two-thirds vote of both chambers, with the VP still being acting president during this period. Anyway, you get the point. In most cases, the vice president just takes over. But what if both the president and the VP are simultaneously removed from office? Well, then we go down the line of succession detailed under the Presidential Succession Act of 1947. Firstly, we go to Speaker of the House, who's currently Nancy Pelosi. Then, if she dies or can't do it, we go to President Pro Tempore of the Senate, which is Patrick Leahy. Then we go down the US cabinet, in order that the 15 departments were created. First, this would be Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, who's the head of the State Department, which was created in 1789, all the way down to the Secretary of Homeland Security, whose department was created in 2003. But what would happen if things got even crazier, and all of these officials died, and there was no one left in the line of succession? It is obviously very unlikely that all of these officials would meet their end in individual cases, but there is one annual event in which all of these officials are together in one room, the Presidential State of the Union. Luckily though, there's a contingency plan. Every State of the Union, the President appoints a cabinet member who will be the President in the event that both the President and Vice President, as well as everyone else in the line of succession, dies. They're called the Designated Survivor, and they're taken to an undisclosed location to watch the address remotely. Congress also appoints some survivors, such as a senator and congressional staffer, to carry out the duties of Congress if all of the representatives and senators were suddenly killed during the ceremony. All of these designated survivors remain at the undisclosed location until the address is over, and the president, as well as everyone else, safely leaves the area. This tradition originated in the 1950s, following worries of a Soviet nuclear attack during the address, but it wasn't until the 1960s that the practice was first put into effect, with 1981 being the first year designated survivors were officially recorded. But what about the worst case scenario? What if the designated survivors were to die too? Well, what was left of the Supreme Court, because not every justice attends the State of the Union, would decide what to do. Ultimately though, the role would very likely fall to the highest ranking official left in government, according to State Department sources. This would likely be the Deputy Secretary of State, who is currently Wendy Sherman. If no political officials were available though, it would go to the highest ranking non-political official in government, which would be the State Department's Under Secretary for Political Affairs. Finally though, let's discuss the more likely scenario of a presidential election, as well as the election of the Congress, being postponed. Donald Trump floated this idea in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and although the president cannot unilaterally postpone an election, that power goes to Congress, Trump's musings sparked questions on what would happen if a president was not inaugurated on January 20th, 2021. According to the 20th Amendment, the presidential term begins on January 20th and ends on January 20th four years later. No ifs or buts. So, obviously, a law postponing the election would face legal challenges. But, assuming it was allowed to stand, here's who would take over in the interim. Perhaps surprisingly, it would not have been Vice President Mike Pence, as he is elected with the President and his term would also end on January 20th. It also wouldn't be Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, as she's a member of the House of Representatives, which is elected every two years, so her term would have expired on January 3rd. It would therefore fall to the Senate pro tempore to be the caretaker, as senators are sworn in for a six-year term. At the time, this would have been Republican Chuck Grassley, because Republicans controlled the Senate at the beginning of the year. But since a third of senators are up for election every two years, those running for re-election would be ineligible to take their seats for a new session, since they wouldn't have been officially elected. That means that if the 2020 election was delayed, we would be left with 65 senators comprising the entire legislative branch in this alternative January 20, 2021. And because mostly Republicans were up for re-election, there would be 35 Democrats and 30 Republicans. That's significant too, 
because since the Senate pro tempore is reliant on which party controls the Senate, Vermont Senator and Democrat Patrick Leahy would then become acting president until an election was held and duly elected president was sworn in. But what do you think? Are these plans enough or should more be put in place? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Remember, you can always join the conversation on Twitter and Instagram, where we post even more often than YouTube. Check out our pages for regular updates and clear explainer graphics so you can stay informed while you scroll. Thanks for your support. As always, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers for making videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos just like these people, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that is in the description.